Hi, I'm Craig Putnam from WPI's Robotics Engineering Program. In these videos, we've been looking at analog and digital sensors. In this particular video, we're going to look at how you might interface to certain kinds of digital sensors that use serial interfaces. In particular, we're going to look at the I squared C and SPI interfaces. First, a little background. If we have a digital sensor, we have some type of a digital output, uh, a bit uh, in the simplest case from a push button type of switch that's either going to be high, let's say five volts or true or one, or low, zero volts or false. If we have multiple bits that we need to output, we've got two ways that that can be handled. One way is that the, there are multiple I.O. lines and the output bits are, are sent out in parallel. So multiple lines are read simultaneously and for N bits you need to have N output lines. The other way of doing it is to send the bits out serially. So you need fewer lines and what happens in this case is that the bits are sent out one line, one after another in time. Right? And both I squared C and SPI are examples of serial protocols. So that's what we're going to be looking at is how this is accomplished in these two different protocols. Let's start with SPI. The SPI protocol was developed by Motorola in 1979 and first appeared in the 68000 series of microprocessor chips. SPI is the simpler of the two uh, from an electrical standpoint and it's simpler from a protocol or software standpoint as well. With SPI, what we have are four I.O. lines that together are called the bus. So let's go through these four I.O. lines that are going between the master and the slave. The lines are called SCLK for the clock, MISO for master input slave output, MOSI, master output slave input, and the last line is called slave select or SS. The S clock line is simply a square wave that is generated by the master and everything that's happening between the master and the slave is synchronized to that square wave that the master is generating. So this is what's called a synchronous protocol and all of the bits that are being moved from the master to the slave or from the slave to the master move in concert with uh, edge transitions, rising and falling edges on that clock signal. The MISO line, the master input slave output line, is as its name implies, a data line that, where data is going from the slave, the slave is the output, to the master, which is the input. So, so bits are traveling from the slave to the master. The MOSI line is exactly the opposite. Data is flowing from the master, or the output side, to the slave, the input side. The last line, the slave select line, is used for when there are multiple slave devices. Let's look at the notation here on this uh, figure. We can see that the SS letters have a bar over it. This is electrical engineering notation for inverted. Okay, So the slave select line uses what's called inverted logic. So you might think that if you wanted to select a slave, a particular slave device, you would take that slave select line high or true, okay? But in fact, what happens is, is that to select a particular slave device, you need to take that slave line low or false. And so the, the, the logic of the situation is inverted, and that's why the bar is uh, written over the, uh, the name of the uh, signal line, SS in this case, and that's to indicate to you that this is using this inverted logic. So if you have multiple slaves, how do you differentiate? How do you address or select one slave as opposed to another? Well, this is done by having multiple slave select lines. Here's where we start using more pins on the master device, because for each slave device that exists in the system, uh, you need a, a slave select line running from the master to the slave. So for example, in this figure where we have three slaves and the one master, we end up needing on the master side three lines plus three additional lines. We need the clock line, the MISO line, the MOSI line, which are common to all of the devices, master and slave, and then running from the master device to each one of the slaves, there's a slave select line. 
So in this case, we need now six, a total of six lines on the master in order to support three slaves. So the problem, or one of the challenges with the uh, SPI system is that as the number of slaves goes up, once it gets past three or four, we start getting uh, into the point where we're really starting to chew up a number of the I.O. lines that are available on the master, and this can become a problem. Okay, so we've discussed so far how you select a particular slave. So now, what's happening? The clock is running on the master. That clock signal is going to all of the slaves, but in one in particular, the one that you've selected, that clock signal is driving uh, the logic inside that slave. The master can send data down the master output slave input line from the master to the slave, and each bit that is sent down that I.O. line is being peeled off, let's say, a byte of data that was handed over to the master. And so it, it peels off each byte in turn and sends it down that line from the master to the slave. At the same time, the slave can be sending data back to the master, if there's data to be sent, and uh, those two uh, data paths are independent of each other. The, uh, the master can be sending to the slave at the same time that the slave is sending to the master. One bit gets transmitted up or down uh, each one of those lines for every uh, clock cycle there is on the clock line. You will typically use library calls to accomplish all of this, to set up your particular I.O. lines that you're going to use for SPI uh, on your microprocessor, and you'll make library calls in order to send it or receive data. SPI actually has four different modes that it operates in, and you'll have to select one of those modes. The mode does not have to be consistent from one slave to the next. In other words, one slave device could operate with uh, mode one, another slave could operate with mode two, and so on. Um, what has to be the, the case, though, is that the master and the slave must be using the same mode in order to be able to communicate. So if you have slaves that are different modes, uh, then the master has to uh, switch between modes to match the mode of the slave as it selects each one of those slaves. The SPI protocol is very loosely defined. Uh, it does not specify things such as the clock rate or, or the, the, in other words, the data rate. Uh, it does not uh, specify addressing schemes other than the slave select line. Uh, there's no flow control, and as I mentioned, there's no error recovery. All those things are, are up to you uh, to add on if, if you wish. As a matter of fact, the SPI protocol does not even specify things such as voltages to be used. So, so whether you're using 3.3 volts or 5 volts or whatever, uh, that's uh, entirely up to the devices uh, that you're working with. So in conclusion, SPI is a very lightweight protocol that's easy to use. It requires a minimum of four data lines to connect together a single master and slave and an additional line for every additional slave. Let's now look at the I squared C protocol. I squared C stands for inter-integrated circuit, and it's a much more sophisticated protocol than SPI. I squared C requires only two wires to communicate between master and slave devices. So from that standpoint, it's, it's already better and simpler than SPI. But this comes at a price, and we'll talk about that in a second. I squared C is what's called a multi-master protocol. Different devices can become the master at different points. And so whether a device is a master or a slave depends on the role it's playing at the moment. With I squared C, you have two wires, and those wires are called SDA for data and SCL for clock. Unlike SPI, there are no slave select lines. So how do you determine who's the master and who's the slave, and, or which uh, slave you, the master wants to talk to on the I2C bus? This is done through the protocol and through addressing in the protocol. Each I2C device has a unique address associated with it. And the master, uh, when the master acquires the, the bus, uh, has to specify the address of the slave it wants to talk to. So this is all handled through the, uh, through the protocol itself. Now each one of the devices has to have an address. Those addresses are typically seven bits. 
So seven bits gives you a total of 128 unique addresses. So this would imply that the universe of I2C devices is limited to 128 different devices. That's clearly not enough. You might want to have multiple devices on your bus that might have the same address uh, because you want uh, you know, three of these temperature sensors, for example, and they're all the same. They all have the same address. Well, that's not going to work. So there's a couple different ways that this can be handled. One way that this is handled is manufacturers will supply different variations of the same chip with a different address. So you can buy this particular temperature sensing chip with one of half a dozen different addresses, for example. Another way that it's handled is through externally uh, set configuration pins. In other words, the chip can use one of several different addresses depending on how you jumper some external pins uh, on, the, on the chip. So there's a variety of ways of, of handling these address conflicts. The third way that the address problem is resolved is through 10-bit uh, addressing. So instead of 7 bits, uh, there's a way of specifying additional address bits. And I'm not going to go into the details on this, but it allows you to expand uh, the, the address uh, range uh, tremendously. So once communication is established on the I2C bus between the master and a particular slave, it's time to start transmitting data. Data is transmitted in 8-bit bytes, and so you can specify uh, a, a number of bytes or just a single byte that's transmitted the direction that it needs to go between from the master to the slave or vice versa. Uh, the protocol allows you to specify a number of different things along those lines. I squared C, unlike SPI, does specify particular clock rates. One of the things that you have to specify when setting up your I2C protocol is the choice of clock rate. There are three standard clock rates, 100 kilobits per second, 400 kilobits per second, and 3.4 megabits per second. That last speed, the highest one, is possible only with some uh, additional uh, help and work in the protocol and only for a certain class of devices. So you tend to be limited for most devices to the 100 and 400 kilobit per second speeds. One of the differences between I squared C and SPI has to do with the direction of the data lines. In I squared C, the SCA and SCL um, lines are both bidirectional. In the SPI protocol, every line is unidirectional. The MISO line goes from the slave to the master. The MOSI goes from the master to the slave. So the data only flows in one direction. But in I squared C, the data on either of the two uh, wires can flow in, in both directions. So all in all, the I squared C protocol is much more sophisticated than SPI. Um, and it allows you to accomplish additional things over what you can do with SPI. So there's a trade-off here. So this brings us to a conversation of which one is better. Which, you know, if I can choose between doing SPI or, or I squared C for a given uh, project that I'm trying to accomplish, which do I want to use? So let's look at uh, and compare them a little bit side by side to, to try to answer that question. The first thing we can look at is just the complexity of the wiring, number of pins and, and things of that nature. So on that front, SPI requires three plus N connections going from the master to N slaves. All right? So if you had just master and one slave, it'd be four wires, master and three slaves, it would be uh, six wires and so on. I squared C requires two wires regardless of how many masters and slaves there are on the bus. So from that standpoint, I squared C is a clear winner. Let's talk about data rates now. Well, with SPI, there is no specified data rate. The clock signal is whatever you drive the clock at. It will depend uh, to some degree on the particular devices that you choose, but the protocol does not limit you to any particular speeds. I squared C, on the other hand, you have these specific set speeds that are part of the protocol. As I mentioned before, 100 kilobit per second, 400 kilobit per second, and under certain circumstances, 3.4 megabit per second. So from that standpoint, SPI wins.
I've seen uh, SPI implementations that have achieved 10 megabit per second, and that those are not at all uncommon. So the bottom line is that which one is going to work best for you is going to depend on your situation. In some cases, I squared C may be a, a better solution than SPI or vice versa. It really is going to depend on, on what you're trying to accomplish. So that's it for SPI and I squared C. I hope this video has been of use.